Because okay. actually, what I'm going to discuss, I'm sorry, I need to close the window because of the noise outside. Okay, it's because uh, what I'm going to start right now, it's just transition from things that are known to things that are not known, okay? Mm -hmm. So therefore, I have a proposal that we will uh, gradually move to kind of research lecture seminar, okay? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <clears throat> So what I'll go to talk today, I'll go to speak about, I'll go to talk about, uh, okay, quasi maps. It's how they are called in mathematics or gauged uh, sigma model, how people call it in physics. And um, today I'd like to explain some problems, some questions that we can ask. And um, we will actually do it. We will start in D complex equal to one. And then we will move to D complex equal to two because the setup that I'm going to explain is the same in uh, all dimensions, okay? So meanwhile, we will see in this process how points in this setup are replaced by uh, strings in this setup, okay? <clears throat> but first, let me try to explain some basics, okay? So, I may start with the map CP1 to say CP, CPN, okay? So what kind of maps I'm going to study? I'm, uh, I'd like to use the technique of equivariant cohomology. So I'd like to have such maps that have uh, a lot of uh, U1 actions, okay? So there is a lot of U1 actions here. There is also U1 action here, okay? Moreover, <coughs> Ah, okay. So if I'm going to preserve this U1 actions, I, I'd better consider CP1 with only two marked points that I'll call white. And these are exactly lots of Manin white points. Okay, so what is uh, so important about these white points? I want to have evaluation here, okay? So here is the difference between uh, Quasi maps and stable maps. For quasi maps, <clears throat> so in the general quasi maps, I do not need to have evaluation anywhere. Okay? So I don't know how to call this space. Maybe it's better to call it given tile space. But uh, okay, let us call it given time space. 
given tile maps. So given tile maps is uh, is such that you have evil, so given tile maps are quasi maps such that you can have evaluation at zero and infinity, okay? So basically it means that if you have pre-image of zero and here you have pre-image of pole, they could coincide here. But they cannot coincide here. And you see that uh, this space, namely given tell maps to toric variety, is uh, very close to the loss of mining space. So we see given tile space. Given tile maps are just similar to loss of mining space. Hmm? It's interesting. Now we will have we will have, we will have such space. We will have this U1 action. So after we have this U1 action, I mean here, we may consider localization. Equivariant. And it is exactly equivalent localization that we discussed. Right, Donald? Mm -hmm. Yes. Remember that we discussed how to compute cohomology of CPK. Mm -hmm. So while CPK is uh, CK plus one over C star, and we it's better to take this zero out, computation of cohomology of CPK, seem to come from the point that is invariant under this system. So it's a limiting point. Mm -hmm. I just recall that we had the formulas like polynomial of sigma, d sigma over sigma k plus one. So in particular, we see that it comes from this space. Now, I also explain that if we look at localization on this CPK, we may see that uh, that uh, so we so so this is these were ordinary cohomology, but if we consider it equivariantly, equivariance means that we use uh, we put some parameters m one. Mk. You see, you may ask why I call these parameters equivariant parameters for u1 to the k acting on CPK. You may ask why I call these equivariant parameters m1, mk, because m seems to be a strange uh, notation for uh, 
equivalent parameter. However, I am doing this because of the physical reason. In physics, these M's are called twisted masses, okay? Later, I'll come back, not today. I'll come back to the physical interpretation, to interpretation of this in physics. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, these are just equivariant parameters. So in this case, equivariant ring is, okay, actually, it's better to do it like this. So I choose K plus one M's, and the only difference would enter the game. Because these M's come from the C star to the power K plus one action on C K plus one. Mm -hmm. so, so here I actually have, uh, here I actually have K plus one. C star to the K plus one. I consider K of them as external and as external symmetry and one as a gauge symmetry. Mm -hmm. I use only one to factorize. So the formula that I'm going to have would be Polynomial of sigma, sigma plus or minus, it depends, plus M1, sigma plus MK plus 1. So uh, coefficients here are 1 because uh, charges of this CK plus 1 or weights are all the same and equal to 1. And here I have the sigma. So by shifting sigma to m k plus one, I see that only one uh, contribute. So here I actually have polynomials, so I need to see what I call by sigma. Is it the action of the total or it's a diagonal action or it's uh, the action that is a difference? So basically, this is the structure. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, so this formula, that is a prototype of what uh, I'd like to discuss, is for dimension zero. So what is important here? Important here is that we have two poles. So we have K plus one poles. And here is the contour integral. And contour integral just tells us which poles should be included and which should not be included. Mm -hmm. Because this formula before the integral and even the integral this thing contains information only about weights of C stars only about space and weights However, with the same space and weights, I can have different, okay. Okay. So when I have CK, 
over C star, this thing is not defined. I need to add the moment map information. So moment map information is in the shape of the contour. In particular, I could choose a contour that uh, I can choose a contour that does not contain any of the points. <laughs> so answer would be zero. Yes, it would be the case like no points included. Would, would correspond to C star to the K. Sorry, what is this C star to the K? No points, no fixed, no fixed points. Oh, okay. Because no fixed points means no cohomology. Mm -hmm. So here, inclusion, you see, inclusion of the pole, mm -hmm. inclusion of the pole. Corresponds to particular. So the, the set of poles, the, the set of poles that is included here, corresponds to particular uh, space. So let us consider the simplest example. So CP1 is sigma plus M1, sigma plus M2. The sigma, all points included. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Andre, may I ask a question to that? Just to, to see if I understand correctly. So if you say all points included, you mean that we chose the one action or the C star action such that we have fixed points. Okay, so I, here I use plus, minus M1, minus M2. Yes. So it means that, uh, that we choose that on CP1, there are two fixed points. Yes, okay, okay. Now, and, and also you, you see here, CP1 is compact. This thing has a regular limit. When M1 goes to zero and M2 goes to zero. Actually, the critical thing is M1 minus M2. Because in this case, uh, we are just computing uh, cohomology we are computing piece of cohomology of CP1 that is exactly the full cohomology. Mm -hmm. For more complicated manifolds, it will be a piece of cohomology. For toric, it will be the full cohomology. Now, let us see what would happen if we choose a contour that goes around only one point. Sorry. Then 
say point stigma equals to minus M2 is not included? And the answer is so polynomial, okay, sigma, sigma minus. So the answer is the residue here, only here at M1, at minus M1. So the answer would be 1 over M1 minus M2. And here polynomial would be evaluated exactly at this point minus M1. Ah, sorry, no integral. So here, you see, I can take polynomial equal to one. It would be this one over M1 minus M2. And this is exactly thing that I would call, I don't know, given Tal Nikrasov or Nikrasov, I don't know who's. So I prefer to call it Nikrasov. Not only because Nikrasov is my friend, but because may, mostly Nikrasov uh, insisted on computing equivalent volumes. Okay. I don't know. Maybe given time Nikrasov. Equivariant volume. in complex dimension equal to one. Okay? So you see how it goes. So this is the structure. Now, it is instructive to play for CP2. Okay, play the same game. For CP two, so in this case you have you will have more options. Once again, put here pi of sigma, sigma plus m one, sigma plus m two. Sigma plus M3. And here we have several options. So it is instructive to see how many how many configurations you can get. Okay, play with play with contours. So if you include all three points, you will definitely get, as you see, CP Two. However, I think you can have planes. So, so you may play with it. Okay. And there is a question that I actually should know, but I don't really know. How uh, let me tell you something. So inclusion of the point seems to be like adding a compactification divisor. Okay?
at the moment I don't know how to prove it, but it is uh, it is very plausible. Okay. Maybe at some moment I'll try to explain you why why I think it is so. Uh, so I feel it intuitively, but uh, right now I cannot give a proof. But I but it's my fault. You see, it's not that it's unknown problem. People study this. Basically, because it's a fixed point, in some sense. Okay. So here I explained this formula. So for completeness, I need to say that. Uh, that if you have uh, CK over C star L, you have a lot of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So these possibilities depend on what? They depend, sorry. So when I have this, I told you that each C star could have different weights and different components. So there is a weight matrix. So C star I is acting. on C, J, with the weight Q, Q, I, J. So there is this matrix, okay, C, A. Plus, so, 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 so starting from this, we can easily write what? We can easily write similar formula having M1 etc. MK. Now there is something that you have to integrate. So here I put Q1. So where you act with a charge I and put your sigma I. And here I have a sum, etc. Q I K sigma L. Sigma I, of course. So I have uh, this big denominator. Of course, I have numerator. So here sum goes from one to L. Here I have integral over D sigma one d sigma l and here i have a choice of the contour and this 
corresponds to, of course, to moment map. Basically, it tells me what poles here should I choose. Actually, not poles, but you see this multipoles. Since I'm integrating over sigma 1, sigma L. And there is some combinatorics that is going on, but I'm not very strong in combinatorics. I'm trying to explain you what is going on. Uh, you may uh, train this playing with different formulas. However, I would prefer to see first what is going on before I'll start playing with formulas, okay? So every time when the formula explains, uh, appears, I need to see what's going on. So this theory was for d complex equal to zero, okay? So it would happen if I just map, map a point there. Now, I'm going to map not only a point, I'm going to map here a CP1. Okay, so when I'm mapping a CP1, <coughs> I have the space of maps and I have extra action. Here I have extra action of U1. So it, so it would mean that I, that I would have uh, equivalent parameters corresponding to this action. Moreover, I would have something that I'd like to call degree. So when I go here, first addition, add equivalent parameter, add degree. But, but that's not all, because <clears throat> when I mapped a point, I had only one uh, place where I could make evaluation, okay? When I'm mapping CP1, I have two points of evaluation. Okay. So, would I write it down in terms of evaluation observables? I put here uh, some elements of cohomology. However, since I'm working on the toric variety as a target, I should put here, so I, I can, in principle, replace it by uh, putting uh, here the cohomology class. Mm -hmm. However, we will see that it's not the only thing that can happen in this game, okay? Um, one question. Oh. 
I'm sorry, yes. one question. These um, points of evaluation, they are supposed to be the fixed points of the U1 action? Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. So I, yes, that, that's, yes, exactly, yes. That's why I call them zero and infinity. Mm -hmm. The fixed point, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, so what are the so what are things that I could compute here? So, before before I added equivalent parameters, I could think that uh, that uh, I should put. Uh, Observables here. And these particular points made out from evaluation. However, now I, I could say, look, I could even, even compute equivalent volumes or something mixed. Okay. So adding equivalent parameter, I can have uh, a lot of finite results. So it is a mixture of equivariant uh, of equivariance and uh, and uh, observables that are here. I still have this nice formula. So this was for ordinary cohomology, and this comes from something like evaluation observable, and this comes from equivariance. Okay? So I have two choices. So, so that's how people will say it. I have several choices to feed up the dimension problem. So before I'll write, before we will write formulas, and actually I would like to postpone writing formulas for, uh, I mean, generating formulas for tomorrow. Today I'd like to consider, so let us discuss one, what may happen. To see this, let us not consider thing in full generality. From what I told you, it is clear how to do it in full generality, because we have this, this space of maps explicitly given. But I would need to say almost almost explicitly given. When I say almost explicitly given, I need to say that, uh, remember we computed this space, CPN plus one, D plus one. Remember we computed this space. So this included freckles. Mm -hmm. But if I consider the maps of CP1, I have to exclude something from this space. Namely, if all freckles would come to a point, I would think that I cannot do evaluation there. Okay. 
So actually, I would like to. So actually, I would have not exactly this space. I would have uh, some modification of this space. However, this modification is uh, pretty tractable. Okay. So let us discuss these spaces, uh, modifications, and different phenomena that could happen. Okay. So uh, I, I hope I explained you the rules of the game. So let us study this term by term. Moreover, we will see that it is reasonable not to restrict oneself to study only CP1 maps, maps of CP1. We will see that it is reasonable to consider maps of C, not only CP1. And we will see it also in a moment. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I'll try to explain it to you in examples. First, let us see, let us consider map of CP1 to CP1, particular case, example. Degree one, okay? Mm -hmm. So let us see what kind of phenomena could we have here. So the, the formula is in homogeneous coordinates, y1 is a1, sorry, y0, zero, a0, zero, zero, z0 zero plus a0, zero, one, Z1. Y1 is A1, 0, Z0, zero plus A1, one, 1, Z1. Okay? So here we have C4. And uh, actually, we have an action of C star here. So previously, we said, so quasi-maps. So what were quasi-maps? Quasi-maps was space of all A's. Such that uh, not all A's. equal to zero. So previously it was CP3. Okay. Let us write it down in homogeneous coordinates. Y1, because you see, I'd, I, I would like to write it in homogeneous coordinates because if you, if you came from physics, you have more intuition in uh, non-homogeneous coordinates than in homogeneous, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So when a physicist thinks uh, about CP1, he says point at infinity, and he prefers to think about C, not about homogeneous coordinates, right? Mm -hmm. So we prefer to think about it in terms of this uh, compactified plane, okay, or compactified cylinder, not in terms uh, of lines. And when we are talking about instantons and, they, and their behavior and holomorphic maps, we also would like to have uh, some uh, space with coordinates that we understand and not the equivalent classes. That's why here I am dividing y1 over y0 and I will call it y. And here I would also divide in the similar way. A00 plus A01, Z1 over Z0, A10 plus A11, Z1 over Z0. Mm -hmm. And I'll call it Z. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry for being that slow, but I actually think it's important. Mm -hmm. And you will see why. Because uh, when we will talk about given Talnikrasov quasi maps, we will see that they are different a bit from, uh, from uh, ordinary quasi maps. Okay? And we would like to see this difference. And since this would involve cohomology and compactification, yes? Mm -hmm. No, since it would involve cohomology or uh, compactification, it will bring cohomology. And we would like to see the cycles that, that would appear when we compactify. Okay? So let us do it together slowly. Mm -hmm. Donald, yes? Yes, perfect. So if I'm too slow, please uh, stop me. Okay. Uh, please push me, okay? Okay. Because uh, you see, Pasha, it was Pavel's uh, task <laughs> to say, no, you go too fast. So, so let us divide by a01. So that's why I want to have everything here. So I would like to take A0, okay. A01, A11. I'd like to take them out. Mm -hmm. And here I'll have Z plus a zero zero over a zero one mm -hmm. z plus a one zero a one one so now this thing is what uh, physicists fluently write as constants z minus a, z minus b, okay? Mm -hmm. But we need to see what is a, b, c in terms of, in terms of this matrix elements. What we are adding what we are demanding. So, we want to have a condition. Maybe we would like to have a condition that uh, 
that we have. So one desire. Desire one. Have evaluation at zero. Okay. So now let us see when do we have evaluation at zero. And if we have it, what, what is its value? So we need just to take z equals to zero. And we see that evaluation at zero is something like a zero zero over a zero over a one zero. Huh. However, on quasi maps, they could be zero simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Now we see these, when these are both zeros, it would mean that uh, two things come together. Pre images of zero and infinity come together to zero. So, so we have in, so we have problem in co-dimension in complex co-dimension two. We need to do something. So we have to blow it up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now let us have another desire. You see, when I put when I put this desire, that it would not mean later on that I would like to satisfy all these desires. So it's potential desires. So if I want to have a relation at zero, I need this. Now, another desire to have a relation at infinity. Mm -hmm. When I when I look at this formula, I may think that uh, I always have a relation at infinity, but uh, I could cheat myself. Zero and infinity are similar. I think you may think you may cheat yourself that C is evaluation at infinity for all A and B. However, what happens if A and B simultaneously go to infinity? Mm -hmm. It means that A01 and A11 both go to zero. So it's another co-dimension two something. And we need to blow it up if we would like to satisfy desire two. Okay. Now, another thing. Just imagine that we would like to do localization under this U1 action that takes Z1 over Z0 to E to the I5 Z1 over Z0, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is so this is an action 
on the space of maps. Mm -hmm. So it's diffeomorphism that acts on the space of maps. So geometrically, geometrically, it's clear how to make such an action. This formula is y is a z. When I transform z, I transform a. Okay? So it means So when I'm making this transformation, however, in making this transformation, I need to choose a representative. A representation of the coordinates of the yes, domain. Yes. So in particular, I could say that this is charged plus one, and this is charged by zero. Mm -hmm. So this U1 action in homogeneous coordinates is like this, and uh, and this is defined up to, or I can do similar things here. So it is the, so it is up to diagonal action acting on all these edges, because it is something that I am uh, factoring out anyway. And the result would be independent. Now let us come to this formula. And here it means that this A is charged by one and this B is charged by one. Now let us see what happens with this C. Is it actually charged? So this C, this constant, is A01 over A11. It is not charged. I'm writing you these two pictures because sometimes it is easier to think in terms of this picture, and sometimes it's easier to think in terms of this picture. OK? So basically, what is the result of this external C star action. It moves points A and B. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I so now I am coming to this uh, picture. Here is CP1. Here is point A. Here is point B. So C star moves these points. Good. Now, and uh, leaving this point fixed, and now we are exactly in the setting. Now we are in the setup of lots of mining space. So now let us see. So we so we have this thing with the with the sister direction. But it is exactly the the piece of the, the it, it was the, the definition of the solosive mining space was a particular compactification, okay, of this space. So, uh, however, now it's now it's an external symmetry. Hmm? Uh, but I have questions. Uh, so yes. in, the, in this case, A and B are always comes in pairs, right? One is zero and one is a pole of the map. And it's so a very you, good question. And, and because, you ask, uh, yeah. and you ask, because, you want uh, because later on, mm -hmm. I will uh, add two points and it'll be an interesting thing what's, what's come out. So you are, you are foreseeing the problem, okay, but uh, following advices, I prefer to go slowly. Okay, so, uh, yes. so just let, let me just finish my question. So if yes. you act you want action on this uh, space of maps, 
this A and B rotate simultaneously, not independently. So it seems simultaneously. Yes. So it's isn't it a bit different from loads of money in space? Because in that case, you can just move A and B separately. No, uh, because in loss of uh, loss of money in space, once again, it's compactification of. So, uh, so okay, in lots of money cases, you, you have different actions, but here, but here we have this uh, common action. Yes, sorry, sorry, you, you're right. Here, here you have this common C star. Okay, so they are the same. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> uh, no, not, no, I'm not saying that they're the same. So one is inside another. Okay. 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 Thank you. You see, but at the moment, I just would like to. So let, let, let us study some examples. Okay. So I'd like to think about. Uh, so I'd like to think about the fixed point, okay? And as always, I have to say that uh, that it's hard here to find the fixed point. If you if you would like to so so fixed uh -huh. point here. No, of course, fixed point here is clear. It's one A and B are here. Okay. So actually it's better to say not fixed point, because as always, fixed point does not have uh, exact meaning. Like uh, when we are Doing localization, it's my favorite example. Like when we are doing, when we are discussing CPN plus CPN, yes? So what is the fixed point? We go, uh, we go above and the uh, fixed point uh, is, uh, is unclear, okay? No, sorry, sorry, sorry. Here, fixed point is kind of clear. So, uh, but in order to see the fixed point, ah, I know how to how to say. So, in order to see the fixed point, we need to. Uh, we probably would like to have an extra action. So. Uh, So uh, let us see what could be the fixed point. So when A and, A and B will collide zero or infinity so that they kind of bubbles off uh, several components. Ah, so, so, so here, so here there are different cases okay you mean each of the so, bubbles or yes so uh, so in this case there are several possibilities exactly one possibility is when a and b collide here and i think the whole point is when they bubbles up then those extra uh, components does not carry a U on action. So uh, they can be a fixed points. Am I right? Yes. Uh, however, so, so at, at least a region, we see. So uh, in, localization, in localization, we always compute the region around fixed point. 
not the fixed point. So, so it means that A and B are closed here. So, in, in order, when we compute contribution of this fixed point, we may forget about the rest. So, in this case, this fixed point is uh, the case of C. So, like in the covariant co computation of uh, CPN, okay, when we compute a covariant co localization in CP, uh, say in CP1 case, we have localization here and here. And when we do this localization, it is pretty enough to replace it by a complex plane. Okay? And to study things here. And when you want to compute the full thing, you add contribution from this plane and contribution from this plane. Okay? Similarly, here, when you'd like to compute contribution from CP1, you, you also have similar things. And now it is a place where you see Nikrasov. So here you say here you see Givental Nikrasov theory for a plane, for a complex plane, with one point. And here we have similar theory. And if you want to compute CP1, you need uh, somehow to glue them together. So why I consider this very important remark? Why I consider this a crucial remark? It is because, let us stop for a, for a moment here. It is because in, uh, constru in, in construction of his theory, Nikrasov studied instantons and four dimensional theory on C square, mostly on C square. However, this thing may be considered as a localization of the instantons on the two-dimensional complex toric variety. So actually, it is something that I have not seen to be considered in uh, now in Nikrasov theory. Consider toric instantons. So here I have a toric manifold. With the action of C star square. So <laughs> So here are instantons, okay? And now, when we localize with respect to this C star square, we have several regions. Where things are localized. And we have uh, Nikrasa functions here, here, and here. 
But it is interesting to see that they come together from the compact toric variety. And in this case, knowing these local contributions, we may say, oh, now we know answer for rhetoric variety. However, there is also independent computation on toric variety. And this is interesting to see how things come together. And uh, unfortunately, it is a thing that was not done. OK? So so here it's a problem that I think it's an open problem, and one can uh, try to study it. So are those problems are about the two-dimensional instantons or one dimension? So and, and of course, and, and of course, you see, my aim in today's talk is to give you a point of view on phenomena, okay? Telling you what is known, what is not known, and how to treat it. So here is a problem that uh, I think should be studied. So when I say the problem, I would say there is a way. The way to treat it, to check everything, is to study ADHM for toric variety. It is doable. Doable, but not done. Yet. And do this. OK? Also, there is, uh, OK. OK, there are other interesting issues here, but we'll, OK. So it is the first sub-problem. Sub-problem number one. Just do it. Let me tell you why this is interesting. It is interesting because uh, people used to think about the orientation of the instantons and the action of the gauge group that corresponds to tri trivialization of infinity, OK? However, here there is no infinity. In some sense, here, what is called integration over the Integration over the Coulomb branch is already done. I think so. So, so it's, it's an important study problem. OK. Let me continue. You see, that, that's what we already see when we start to think about that problem. Now, here, now, what can we say about uh, such instantons? OK? How they are differ? How they differ from these instantons? You may say, yes, they are exactly these instantons. Because in this language, you know, in this parameterization, you may say that you understand what's going on. You should just exclude, take away case where A and B simultaneously go to infinity. Mm -hmm. 
Borova, they are close to zero. Here they are close to zero. So the space here, so the space seems to be A, that belongs to C. B, that belongs to C. Okay? And also this constant to C. Now, what can we say about this constant? We might say that this constant belongs to CP1. So this is the piece where we have to localize. Now, but it was only one case. It was case A and B coming here. And uh, this thing has what I would like to say physical meaning, okay? Physical meaning here is the following. We can endow this CP1 with a metric. So when we have a metric, we may choose different metrics. So if we say that we have C with a metric, it's exactly, I think it's exactly what we are studying here. So when we are localizing here, we are actually studying Dental. Okay, I don't know how to call it. Okay, so these maps, you see uh, maps from C to CP1, okay? So when we localize, we change the type of the toric source. I think it is uh, an important observation. because C is not CP1, and we do not need this infinity. Now, how can we describe these instantons? We describe these instantons as the instantons in the theory on C, exactly like Nikrasov uh, did, does in uh, for the Maxwell theory. And solutions, let us see what happens with solutions. Solutions come to a constant at infinity. So, so coming to the constant at, at infinity means exactly that we have a solution of the finite action. Finite action on C. So you may ask why I am jumping on it. Finite edge action on C. Let me try to tell you. It's because metric on C, metric on complex plane, is different from the Fubini's 2D metric on CP1. Because if you take the metric on C, then then this region has infinite volume in C metric. And this infinite volume of any uh, neighborhood of infinity makes instanton solution, being solution of finite action, to, to be constant here. And it is while, while and since you become constant, 
it is very easy to have an action of them. Target space U1 on this solution. And it exactly reproduces uh, Nikrasov's picture of instantons that have orientation uh, because uh, at infinity you have uh, the global group acting there. Here you can see it right away. I'm sorry, but it's a uh, silly question. Uh, when you mention finite energy, does it mean that the energy of the map is finite or there is a finite group action? So when just I see make, finite just to make energy, it clear. Okay. It's important issue. So what is the so-called energy actually, actually action? You take holomorphic derivative and you integrate over sigma. Okay? Uh, okay, so that clears. So you're calculating so if energy. Sigma, if sigma is non compact, it means that this thing goes to zero at uh, infinity. So you first consider such space and then take the limit if you wish when uh, position of the instanton goes far away. So it's one definition. Another definition it would be if you consider it as being compact. If it, if it is compact, nothing prevents uh, Uh, to have non-trivial derivative somewhere here. So actually, I should say, I should put it like this, dx square, sorry, not d bar x. So it's a tricky point. And uh, because of this point, uh, we have, I would say, modification in what uh, we call instanton for CP1 and for C. But here I explained why it is not stupid to study instantons for C. Okay? It's because we have it in localization. So uh, it happened that when people study two-dimensional, I mean real two-dimensional instantons, they were thinking in terms of string theory. Of course, they knew that string theory is coming from the sigma model. Okay? But um, mostly they have not thought that it would be interesting to study instantons on the plane. However, uh, four-dimensional instantons were coming from the, not from string, they were coming from the gauge theory. And in the gauge theory, people don't want to, to do it, like I said, on toric uh, manifolds. In the gauge theory, people say, ah, we live in R4. That's why, let us study another story. And that's why, in human's brain, because of different origin of these two things uh, in the modern literature, they are irrelated. That's why when people think about instantons in sigma in two-dimensional sigma models, for some <sighs> historical reason, since it came from string. They, they thinking about compact sources. And in uh, gauge theory about non-compact, uh, that's why 
they are missing structures of each other. You see? That's why people in, uh, okay, not missing, don't want to study structures of each other, you see? Okay. So, So now it's not hard to see that we can uh, compute the volume. So after we know the space, we can compute uh, equivalent volume for these coordinates, A and B. So it would be one R. So we need to enter the equivalent parameters here. And then it depends. I don't know how to, cho how to choose it. I prefer to call it Z, okay? Ah, people sometimes call it H, but since I am close to Nikita right now, I'll call it Epsilon, okay? So, in equivalent volume, we will have this, okay, from this point. By the way, let us see at the same formula. Here we have CP1. CP1 has this C, okay? It's a CP1. We need to fix it somehow. We may fix it in particular, putting here a covariant observable. Because there is a covariant local observable. However, let us for simplicity, think not about a covariant local observable, Let us think uh, about the action of another U1 here with, uh, with M being the covariant parameter. So still, we cannot do anything because it's because this space is compact. Okay. So we need to do something. Still, so it it still means it means that we still need to put here some some equivalent parameter. Or some obser or some observable, sorry. Because equivalent volume of C, equivalent volume of C is uh, is uh, infinity. Uh, is zero, sorry, is zero. Of CP1 is zero. However, we may, we may think differently. We may work equivalently with respect to this U1 and consider only instantons that are in the vicinity of some fixed point on the target. So we can replace CP1 times C times C. We can replace it by 
C times C times C. And we put one over M parameter here, one over epsilon parameter here and parameter here. Now let us see how the target group X. So target group say moves Y1 without, a, without changing Y0. So what was this A? So, so I, I actually would like to understand the weights. You see? You see what I'm trying to do? I am trying to understand the weights of this thing with respect to the target group. So, so from the point of view of the target group, of the target group, this thing has weight plus one, and this thing has weight plus one. Now, my favorite A and B. What are their weights? So it seems that their weights are zero. So here I explain something about uh, this equivariant computation. Now, let us see, do we have any other fixed points? Okay. So we have similar thing at infinity. But we also have another interesting thing. Zero infinity. A can go here and B can go here. Hmm? Maybe it's exactly a phenomena why uh, Nikrasov theory is not uh, is not actually so uh, why why theory on the toric variety is not doable from Nikrasov theory only because let us see but we will see. Let us see what happens here. So first of all, what is this map? Zero of the world sheet goes to the zero of, on the target. Infinity of the world sheet goes to infinity of the target. Okay? So, so this map. So limiting map actually exists. So 
So we may try to look at this map at. So in order to to take the limit, we need to say a is going to zero, b is going to infinity, but then this thing goes to infinity, but then this thing goes to zero. So the question is, what happens with c? Okay. So so you see, there are interesting limits. here. So when a going to zero, b going to infinity, so what is the value at zero? The value at zero is c a over b. So you may think that this is already zero. However, there, there is also C parameter. This C parameter can make it finite. So the only thing that we know is that the rest of the, the the rest of the thing that has no zero at infinity is not going to zero at infinity. So this is a map actually from C star to C star. Okay. And then, as far as I understand, holomorphic maps from C star to C star are given by group multiplication and, and it is not a point. So I think that its contribution most probably is zero. But it has to be checked. So let me put it as a question, okay? What is a contribution from the region where A is going to zero and B is going to infinity? So you see how many interesting questions you can get when you study this issue. You see, I have studied the simplest thing. I have studied P1 to P1 equivalently, and I already found several phenomena, okay? Now,
Now I, I want to make the very last remark. And actually two remarks. But they are related. You see, consider once again, A is going to zero. Now let us consider the case where we have two, A1 and A2, and they both go to zero. What would it mean? I also have to study this, this case. And when they both come to zero, I will say that there is a tangency condition. Not only value of the map, but also its derivative goes to zero. We will have this phenomenon. And finally, I can consider U1 bundle of local coordinate at marked point. The U1 action that has here allows me to construct the churn classes of this U1 bundle. And also study it as an observable. Okay. I think I spoke too much. Yes. So I outlined the phenomena. Mm -hmm. So Donald. Yes. Hmm? May I give you an exercise for tomorrow? Um, sure. Compute equivariant volume. For the space. So we will do only this, okay? For mm -hmm. tomorrow, only this. CP1 to CP1 of degree one. So basically what I did. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let us do it for degree two, okay? That's it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and look, for localization. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so you so uh, idea is to compute it equivalently. With respect to U1 on source and U1 on target. So of course you will get uh, okay, well, let me put it this way. So on target you will say that, uh, that since so uh, I need so you so you will say it is uh, ah sorry Donald sorry mm -hmm. I need to I need to reformulate the question mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. so reformulation of the equation would be C 
study equivalent uh, integral mm -hmm. formula. With respect to U1 on source and U1 on target, Okay, maybe for for degree one. Mm -hmm. Okay, for degree one and two. And identify. And identify different fixed points. Fixed point. Contribution. Okay, so 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 it's better to put it this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, like, for degree zero, the space is CP one. One contribution is one over m. One contribution is minus one over m. Mm -hmm. So these are constant maps. Mm -hmm. Andre, I think I have to go now for uh, yes, yes, and uh, I also uh, want to quit right now. Mm -hmm. But before leaving, I want to make sure that I understand correctly about equivariant volumes. So uh, when you say this Necrosov's equivariant volume on the board, you somehow look at the local neighborhoods where this localization happens and say that locally it, you, it is enough to compute the equivariant volume on the complex plane, not on the whole mapping space. Yes. Uh, it's in a mathematical term, it sounds like you are looking at the neighborhood of the locus of the fixed points and it's normal bundles, normal bundles and compute its Euler, char Euler characteristic or something, whatever character cla characteristic class, uh, computing the term class of that normal bundle and take one over, take a one over that class and saying that it's, it is an equivariant for them. At least this is what I uh, have in mind. Yes, you, you, yes, you may. yes. So then I think I can do the exercise too. So, uh, so we will yeah. see. So can I see you? So we will see tomorrow, I think. So it is correct, right? So yes, I have to calculate all the characteristics of the normal bundles. But uh, but you see, you need to uh, equivariant bundles. Yes. Oh, yes, of course, of course, I have to consider the equivariant bundles. Okay. Uh, yes, and maybe it will be better if uh, uh, ah, so w w when uh, somebody computes the answer, just send me an email, and you will see. Mm -hmm. I see. So uh, so let me try. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll make a, made a mistake. Then you can correct me. You think? <laughs> yes, maybe. Okay, yes. So, okay, so that's what. No, thank you. Thank you for okay. answering the questions. So, I think I have to decouple. So, yes, see yes. you tomorrow. You. Evening. Yeah. Yes, see you tomorrow. Yeah, okay, and so. Hmm? Yes, so our... and, and of course, our desire would be to develop this to higher dimension. Okay, thank you. As you understand. So then, see you tomorrow. Yeah. See you tomorrow. Okay, so I will stop the recording. Yes.